Let's bow our heads and pray as we start here this morning. Lord, we thank you for your Sabbath. We thank you for your watch care, your love. Even in a hard time like this, you tell us that you still love us and you see what's best. And so, Lord, we just pray for Sharon and the family at this point, that you will lift them up and give them their uh, your peace. Lord, be with us here today. Just forgive all our sins. Just wash me clean with your blood. We want to come into your presence and read your Psalms today. Without your Holy Spirit here to guide us, uh, we won't understand the things that you have in store for us. So we ask for your Holy Spirit to be here with power. Thank you, Lord, for all these beautiful people that have come today. We ask for a special blessing to be on each one of them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Title of our lesson this week is The Lord Hears and Delivers. I couldn't help but read that and think to myself, okay, I was curious. So I'll ask you a question right out of the chute here. Does the Lord always hear? <laughs> We're starting off good. My wife says, oh boy. You're talking about Isaiah 59 too? Something, I just know there's something where he says he doesn't listen to the prayers of like the wicked or something like that. Mm -hmm. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Yeah. That's the one. You know, we like to say to ourselves that God hears every prayer, and yet scripture simply doesn't teach that. I saw Tim shaking his head over there, so he knew that. Uh, How about this? Does God hear every sincere prayer? Lisa says penitent prayer. Now, I didn't think, think about that. Is there a difference between a sincere prayer and a penitent prayer? Maybe there is. Maybe not. <laughs> Point taken. <laughs> Sharon, it's nice to see you here. Luann as well. We're so sorry. But I'm glad you're here today. How about the other word here? The Lord hears and delivers. Perhaps this is even more difficult, and we'll talk about this deliverance thing through most of the lesson. Does God always deliver in the way that you expect, or the way that you pray, or the way that you want? Pick. Luann says yes. Oh, you said no. Okay. I was astonished. <laughs> well, if you want to look at it that way, it should be yes, because they, don't, they say that, how do I, if you knew the end from the beginning, that's the way you would want it to be. So you do get what you Now you have to keep that thought in mind for the next whatever we have here, 30, 40 minutes. If you knew the end from the beginning, you wouldn't change a thing, I paraphrased. <laughs> uh, so how come we struggle so hard against the Lord's answers to our prayers then? You're not the only one, I'm not picking you out. You hear what Lisa called us here? Selfish and prideful? <laughs> She's probably not wrong. There's other reasons too. Isaiah 57.1, the, the passage that Paula was referring to is 59.1 or 2. And turn back two chapters in Isaiah. And this one says, The righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. That's a new modern translation. There is, but it basically says the same thing. The righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. There's an interesting story 
I was thinking about it last night while I was trying to sleep. And so this morning I looked to see where it was. It's 1 Kings 14.3. I'm not going to go through this whole story, but this story is about wicked King Jeroboam. This guy is the one that God himself chooses and has Elisha, Elijah sorry, anoint. He does nothing but evil, builds the, the high places up with the worship of Baal and Ashtoreth and all of that stuff. And finally, God's had all he can stand of this guy. So you know what he does to fix the situation? He makes his son sick. And you think to yourself, okay, this guy must really be awful. He's killing his kids off. But it's not what the story says. His son gets sick. Jeroboam knows that these worthless idols are not going to give him any answers. In his heart of heart, he knows that. So he tells his, his wife, his queen, disguise yourself, take off your queenly robe, and go see the prophet of the Lord. Now, the prophet of the Lord is blind at this point, but God, uh, you have people complaining. Oh. There you go. The prophet of the Lord is blind, so he can't see who's coming. So I'm sure the king thought, you know, this man hates me, but he won't know who my wife is. She can dress, you know, like every ordinary citizen would and find out what's going to happen to my son. But before the queen gets to his house, the Lord shows him who's coming. And so she knocks on his door and he says, come in, queen, whoever she was. Not sure we're even given her name. And she comes in. She can see he's blind, so she knows she's in the presence of a prophet. She tells him what the problem is and asks him if the son will live. And he goes through quite a statement there talking about the evils of their family line. And he basically says, every one of your family line, and I don't know exactly how far out that extended, but every one of them are going to die. And none of them are going to be buried. The birds, I think, are eating the ones that die in the country, and the dogs are eating the ones that die in the city. I mean, it's an awful prophecy. But the reason that I bring this up isn't just to tell you a terrible story here. <laughs> then he says about the little boy, go back home. The minute you get into the city, your son will die. And the reason is, is because he is the only one in the house of Jeroboam in whom the Lord, the God of Israel, has found anything good. So he's saving a little boy eternally by taking his life. I start this out because we oftentimes think about the stories in, in Scripture, and I don't blame you, they're fun. You know, Jonah, he's in the belly of a fish, and bam, the, the fish spits him out onto dry ground. We often think that that's on the shores of, uh, of uh, Nineveh, but Nineveh's not on the shore, at least of the ocean. <clears throat> We like to think of Daniel and the lion's den, you know, bam, the lion's mouths are shut and he just spends a peaceful night with some warm cats. Probably not really how it went, but they don't eat him and they're hungry. We like that story. We like the story of the three Hebrews that get tossed into the furnace even after it's heated up so many times that the soldiers tossing them in die tossing them in and they're fine. They're walking around in the furnace. But not all the stories in Scripture turn out that way. <clears throat> Today we're going to read some psalms. The psalms are predominantly, well, I shouldn't say that. The psalms are about split, 
about half of them, 72 to be exact, are psalms about enemies. Did you realize that? I don't know how many enemies you have. We hope the list is short, small, and dwindling, but that's how many the psalms are talking about. Sometimes your enemies can't be helped. Maybe this is uh, silly, but the devil's alive and well. There's a young quarterback that quarterbacks for the 49ers. That's the only team that I really like to watch. And he was picked the very, very, very last guy in the draft. They call that pick Mr. Ir uh, Irrelevant because they usually don't turn out very well. Well, he's doing really well. He's made some records this year and all kinds of things, but no one expected him to do anything. And so no one thought much about it, but he's a Christian and he'll talk about it. So now everybody's talking about how he's terrible and he's not gonna do any good and he's not nearly as good as the other quarterbacks. And I often think to myself, would it be this way if he wasn't a vocal Christian? I'll let you ponder that. <clears throat> Psalms 55, 16 to 22, mostly the 22 side of things. The Psalms unswervingly holds the truth that the Lord is the living God who acts on behalf of those who call upon him. He acts. That's Psalms uh, 55, 16 to 22. That's sort of a synopsis of that. At any rate, they send us into Sunday's lesson here, if you have your lesson, and they give us a psalm to read, Psalms 139, 1 through 18. And as you're looking that up, if you can multitask here, I'll ask you a question. How well does God know you? That's a full-time job, too. I mean, stuff's falling out. And <clears throat> no, but have you ever thought about it? How well does God know you? Don't you think you have some hidden things that he doesn't know about? If we were thinking constantly that God Almighty is right here, my constant companion, is there anything you'd change in your life? Don't answer that. But think about it. Psalms 139, <clears throat> 1 through 18. This is a little longer Psalms, and I couldn't decide if I was going to read this with you or not. But it's, it's a beautiful Psalms. There's a lot in here. And I think that above all things in this quarter, we get to really experience and enjoy the Psalms. And I told you three weeks ago when I was teaching that the Psalms have never been my favorite book in scripture. And for a, a number of people, that's not true. They like the Psalms. Well, I'm beginning to warm to it. <laughs> I see you ladies smiling at me. <laughs> you must be the ones that especially like the Psalms. Anyway, I admit, I'm, I'm warming to it here. Here's the beautiful Psalms. Are you there? Psalms 139, verse one. And Joe has his brand new Bible to try it out here. <clears throat> O oh Lord, this is in the New Living Translation, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. Now we could stop right there and that pretty well covers it. But David gets specific here. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know, some smart guy created Twitter and I guess that's what you're supposed to do if you're a, a tweeter on Twitter. Uh, you're supposed to tell, you know, I'm brushing my teeth, I'm combing my hair. God already knows. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away from you. Well, I don't think distance is what David is talking about here. David was on a donkey or a horse or a mule he didn't get very far. He wasn't in an airplane. He wasn't in a submarine. But when 
our lives carry us away in a direction far from God, God still knows our thoughts. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. I know every, you know everything I do. I'm reading this in this modern version because it just cuts right to the point. You know what I am going to say even before I say it. Lord, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. So God knows my thoughts. He knows everything I do. He knows everything I think and am going to say. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me and too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. Have you ever wanted to be away from God's presence where you were so angry with God that you were like, leave me alone. I'm done. Don't answer that either. <laughs> if I go up to heaven, you are there. Now, David didn't go up to heaven, but if I go in my thoughts to lofty places, God is there. If you go down to the grave, you are there. My highs and my lows, God is there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest ocean, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit them together in my mother's womb. Here David says God and his creative power is working in the formation of a baby. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion in the womb. I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out. Catch this. Before a single day had passed. God knows the story of your life before you're born. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Isn't that a beautiful song? God is with you. When you go far away, God is with you. When you try to hide in the dark, God is with you. When you think he's not there, God's with you. When you're not sure where your life is going to go, just ask him. He already does. <clears throat> Isn't that a beautiful one? To some people, they ask a question at the bottom of, of uh, Sunday's lesson here. Some people might find the fact God knows so much about them, even their darkest secret, a rather frightening thought. I'm not sure that's anyone here, but I ask that question because there probably are times where we're hoping God wasn't looking. <clears throat> Turn with me to Romans 3, 26 and 27. If you've ever worried about God and what he thinks about you, or how you're ever going to become close enough, holy enough, if you want to put it that way, Romans 3, 26.
And it's actually the last part of 26 that I want you to focus on. God himself is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we then boast that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No. Because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law, it is based on faith. So if you ever worry about God knowing everything about you, remember Romans 3, mostly 27, 26 and 27. And we might as well read 28 while we're here. So we are made right with God through faith and, by, and not by obeying the law. So what does that mean? We can go out and throw the law, law aside and, and do whatever we think we want to do? No, it means that when we fail, but we still believe Jesus' righteousness will cover us. The fact of the matter is you can throw the law out and do whatever you want. You'll pay a heavy price, but God can still save you when you come back. <clears throat> Amazing verse there. I'm looking at the clock today a little bit because there's a lot of Psalms. That's New Living. I switch between that and the NIV. Sometimes I'm reading out of the King James. <laughs> anyway, on Monday's lesson, the title of this part of the, of the lesson is Assurance of God's Care. Now, we've been touching on this a little bit, but they specifically have four psalms that they want us to read. I don't think we have time with, with all of them, but I will read uh, Psalms 40, verse 1. This is a neat psalms, too. And I wanted you to notice the very first words of this psalm. Have you ever prayed? and prayed, and prayed, and prayed. Studied scripture, talked to God, complained to God, got angry with God, mm -hmm. <laughs> and felt like you didn't get an answer to your prayer that you wanted. Well, this song is David. <laughs> Very first words, at least in this version, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. You know, we forget about this patience part in our spiritual lives. Sometimes I read about Elijah, who's one of my favorite characters in Scripture, and we think about all the great events in Elijah's life. And he had them. I mean, from, from prating into the king's court and making a declaration and then hiding by the brook Cherif and heading off to the heathen land of of uh, Baal worship in Tyre and Sidon and, you know, the jar of oil that never ran dry and the baby that was resurrected and I'm probably missing stuff here. Uh, then, of course, Mount Carmel and calling down fire and destroying the priests and priestesses of Baal and Ashtoreth. And, and then we were just reading where he's, you know, uh, calling for rain to come back and the rain comes has a little hiccup in there where he runs from a wicked queen. But then he's sitting on a hill and uh, Ahab sends out 50 soldiers to collect him or kill him, whatever worked out. And he calls down fire and they're gone. And another 50 go out and phew, calls down fire and they're gone. The third 50 go out on their hands and knees begging. And the man, man says, fine, we won't call for the Lord to destroy you. But I mean major, major prayer warrior with, with great events in his life, right? Do you know how long it took, just took me to tell you the major events in his life? Assuming we missed a few here and there. There were big gaps between. And do you know what he was doing between? Praying. Praying. Do you know how he got his job as the prophet in the first place? Mm -hmm. He's up in the hill country, I think, of Ephraim. 
You'll have to check me on that. And he's praying for the wickedness of Israel. He's like, you've got to be kidding me. These people are so far from God. And he's praying. And God says, huh, you're just the guy I needed. Why don't you trot down to the king and give him a message? Sounds like a certain, you know, one-way mission here where you're not going to come back. But not when you're working for the Lord. Stuff happens. Anyway, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. May we see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. We don't know what David was going through exactly here, but David's depressed. And I know depression is something that's easy for us to deal with from time to time. We fall into depression or anxiety or any other thing. David's depressed here. He's been praying, and finally he realizes it just wasn't God's timing until now. Assurance of God's care. But as David's life continued, he got more and more faithful. Faith, I guess, would be the word. Turn to Psalms 121. Here's another one. There's two in between that I'm not going to talk about much. Psalms 50 is basically the one that says, Call on me, and I will rescue you. And Psalms 55 says, Give, me, give your burdens to the Lord, and he will take care of you. Now, don't forget those passages, but let's go to Psalms 121 if you're not already there. This one is interesting. 121, there's only eight verses here. They're not sure who wrote this. They're wondering if it may have been Hezekiah. We'll talk about how they used it in a moment, but let's read this thing and kind of go through it. Starts out, I look up to the mountains. And this version makes it easier to understand, for me at least. Does my help come from there? Now, what, is, what does a King James or some other version say here? From where it's coming. From where comes my help? Now, I always thought that was a statement when I read that. So I look at the hills, that's where my help is coming from. But it's not. It's a question. Terry, go ahead. It's a question. It's a question. Now what on earth are they talking about here? What's happening in the hills where he says, I'm going to look at the hills. Is that where my help is coming from? Keep your finger, if you can do that electronically, I'm not sure if in your Bible, keep your finger here, but go to Jeremiah 3.23. Are you there? Our worship of idols on the hills and our religious orgies on the mountains are a delusion. Only in the Lord our God will Israel ever find salvation. This is where they would put their, their shrines, their idols. In fact, uh, go to 1 Kings 14, 23. For they also built for themselves pagan shrines and set up sacred pillars and astereth poles on every high hill and, on under, and under every green tree. This is talking about Israel. They've gone completely pagan. There were even male and female shrine prostitutes throughout the land. 
the people imitated the detestable practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. This is what's going on in the hills. And so now you can understand why David says what he says. In fact, I can show you another one, uh, Deuteronomy 12.2. I mean, there's not much doubt. Of course, Deuteronomy is uh, Moses' synopsis here of what's happened and maybe a few extra things added by other people. When you drive out the nations, this is Deuteronomy 12.2, when you drive out the nations that live there, you must destroy all the places where they worship their gods, high on the mountains, up on the hills, and under every green tree. Break down their altars and smash their sacred pillars, burn their Ashtaroth poles, and cut down their carved idols. It was a disgusting religion, and yet that's what they were doing. Go back to Psalms 40. My Bible lost its place. Psalms 40, verse 1. I wait patiently for the Lord to help me. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair. Sorry, I'm in the wrong place here. Huh? Psalms 121. We already did that, did 40. I looked up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? No. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He is your, your creator. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. Sometimes you're praying away and it feels like your prayer is not getting out of the house and you think I wonder if my God is listening the Lord himself watches over you the Lord stands by your side as your protective shade the sun will not harm you by day nor the moon at night the Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life the Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go. And here's the key to this Psalms, because there has to be at least one of you, myself included, thinking, but wait, bad stuff does happen in this world. But here's the key. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. He's playing the long game. He takes that little boy out of Jeroboam's family because the little boy was the only one he could find anything good in. He lets him die, which we consider to be one of the worst possible things, to save him. The Lord is playing the long game. This lesson asks a question here. What are some practical ways that you can better experience the reality of God's care? I thought about that for a while. Anybody, while studying your lesson this week, come up with anything? What are some practical ways that you can better experience the reality of God's care? Okay. Putting yourself and... Lisa said, go to church. Putting yourself in an environment where you can spiritually flourish. That doesn't mean you should always just stay in the church. You need to go out and tell other people about the good news of Jesus' second coming and the Savior. Terry. Counting your blessings. I was going to tell you a story about myself, but I really didn't want to. So I'll tell you a story about Joyce instead. <clears throat> For those of you that know Joyce, she was our prayer ministries. Actually, she still is our prayer ministries director in this conference until tomorrow. <clears throat> 
Joyce has a son who lives up in the Auburn area, and they have a daughter who's, uh, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, she's handicapped, but she's severely handicapped. She's 10 now, still can't go to the restroom on her own. I mean, she's a huge, huge, huge amount of work for the parents. And Joyce once in a while goes and helps. And I tell you how old Joyce is, but she's still uh, our conference director till tomorrow, which means she's still my boss, so I can't yet. But Joyce is not young. So she was there at their house helping. And for some reason, in the middle of the night, she needed to go down into the garage for some reason, which I've now forgotten. She knocked a glass over. That was it. Lisa said she knocked a glass over up in the house, and she went to the, to the garage to get a broom and something to pick it up so no one would get up in the morning and step on broken glass. Well, as most garage doors do, the garage door closed, and it was locked. It was cold, and she was in her nightgown without a robe, and she was stuck. She didn't want to open the garage door and go around to the front door and, you know, hit the doorbell and wake everybody up, and so she decided... I'm the prayer ministry's director. I'll pray here and see what the Lord will do. She prayed and prayed for a, well over an hour, maybe two hours, and nothing happened. And she was begging the Lord to help her. I mean, she's getting cold at this point, where it's starting to be scary cold. And it seemed as if God didn't care, wasn't listening. So she decides... To praise. She begins to praise the Lord for his goodness. She doesn't know how she's going to get out of the garage, but she begins to praise the Lord. And she's looked all over that garage for that little spare key that's somewhere, you know. Nothing. She's looked over the tool chest, you know, she's opened the doors, nothing. She praises and she praises for a little while. And then she looks over at the tool chest, and there's a gap. She hadn't noticed that gap before. So she put her hand into the tool chest in this gap, and there was a key. And of course, it opened the door. But the story's not over. The next morning, she was joyfully telling her family about how she had gotten out of the garage and where the key was, and they said, there's no key there, there's no gap. So they went back and looked at the tool chest, and there's no gap. But that answer to prayer didn't happen until Joyce started praising. That story was probably better than the one I was going to tell you, but I'll tell you mine anyway. <laughs> some years ago, we decided to get some insurance and on myself. In case I dropped dead, I didn't want Lisa to be stuck with all the big bills that farming can, can have you with. So they required a blood test and a few other uh, checks to see if you were one step away from passing on and they wouldn't give you a insurance policy. So when they checked my cholesterol level, it was really high. Now I tried to eat a decent diet, but I wasn't as careful as I should have been by a long shot. So I thought to myself, if I'm going to pray to the Lord to help me with my health, I at least need to do what I know to do. So I became a vegetarian. This is a number of years ago. Not all the family was, but I thought, you know what? I feel convicted that I need to do this, so I became a vegetarian. Well, the vegetarian thing went on for a number of years, 
I didn't feel any better, didn't feel any worse. I really didn't know what was happening until we took another cholesterol test. And it really wasn't improving. So about that time, Lisa decided we needed to go see Dr. Nedley and his clinic that he runs. And she signed up for the 11-day boot camp. They don't sell it that way, but trust me, that's exactly what it is. And it's a tough, tough 11 days where they are feeding you the finest food that's vegan. And they're feeding you, the, or they're, they're having you run, crawl, push your wheelchair, whatever you can do around a track as far as you can go, as many times as you can go for an hour. And then I think they gave you breakfast. There were hot tubs and cold tubs and, I mean, ice floating in the tubs, kind of cold tubs. I hated that. <clears throat> At any rate... After she got, I was there as a companion, after she got her test results back, I had never ever seen test results that were this comprehensive. So I went to the doctor, Dr. Nedley, who's a super nice guy, and I said, you know what, I think I made a mistake. I should have signed up to do the testing too. Is it possible to still do it? And he says, yeah, I think we can. You will be gone by the time we get the results back, but I can talk to you on the phone. So he tested me. Now, I'm a vegetarian here. I have been a vegan now for 11 days. <laughs> Dr. Nedley calls me and he says, well, I have your test results. If you're planning to die of a stroke or a heart attack, just keep doing what you're doing because it's going to work out for you. He, he, knew, how to, he knew how to get my attention. <laughs> he said... You need to be a vegan. And you know what I thought? I don't want to be a vegan. <laughs> but he said, you need to be a vegan. And by the way, any ingestion of animal products in your system will last for three weeks. So if you're planning on just fudging on the weekends and being good during the week, that isn't going to work. So I thought, fine, I'll give this a try. So for one year, I was an angry vegan. <laughs> I just admitted I was an angry vegan. <laughs> but I felt like I was doing what I knew to do because this is what the doctor told me to do. And I'm not saying this is for any of you. This is what he told me to do. And I was praying that God would make me feel better. I was someone who over the course of time had become allergic to everything out there. If it was green, I was allergic to it. Sort of a problem for a farmer. <laughs> but over the course of that year, that went away. And I'm now mildly allergic to six things, most of which are not outside. And so I became a convicted vegan after the after the first year. But the point is, I didn't feel like I personally could pray and ask the Lord for help with my health when I had been told, you've got a date coming with a stroke or a heart attack, you need to make a course correction. I don't know, what do you think about that? Can we keep doing whatever it is we want to do and expect the Lord to fix our problem? And your problem may not be diet. I'm I'm sharing bluntly here. You may have other issues. But how do you pray and say, Lord, I really want to do what I want to do, but please fix it. And this is what we're talking about here today. What practical ways can you, can you think of to better help uh, experience the reality of God's care? Well, I'll leave you with that, and we'll go to Tuesday's lesson as time is clicking by. There's a couple of neat psalms here as well. I'm going to take you to Psalm 17, verse 7. <clears throat> like I said, I'm warming up to the psalms here. There's some beautiful psalms. Psalm 
Now, the title of this portion of the lesson, The Lord is a Refuge in Adversity. The Lord is a Refuge in Adversity. Psalm 17, 7. Show me your unfailing love and wonderful ways. By your mighty power, you rescue those who seek refuge from their enemies. Here's another one about the enemies. Guard me as you would guard your own eyes. Now, here's the apple of your eye statement in some of the versions that you have, right? Apple of your eye. I looked that up to figure out what in the world is the apple of my eye. I've heard people say, oh, you can see the reflection of something, you know, in your own eye. Well, it's not that complicated. The apple of your eye simply refers to your pupil. That's what they thought was the pupil. But you know how something comes at your face, your eyes, and your eyes will close? You can't even almost keep them from doing so. That's what he's talking to me. Uh, guard me as you would guard your own eyes. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. You've heard the story where they've had a prairie fire come through in a farmstead. Maybe the house survives because they've cleared out around it, but some of the livestock is damaged and how they'll find one of their chickens who's burned to death in the fire. And when they push her aside or maybe take her to bury, boom, out from under her scatters all her chicks. She gave her life for her family. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Protect me from wicked people who attack me, from murderous enemies who surround me. This is David. Show me your unfailing love. Matthew, or Jesus maybe, Matthew 23, 37 uses these same Illustrations. Matthew twenty three thirty seven. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city, then this is Jesus' words, kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings. But you wouldn't let me. God wants you that close to him. He wants you to be under the protecting umbrella of his presence. I don't know. They also gave us some other texts to look at here. I know I'm quickly running out of time, as I always seem to. Uh, Psalms 31, I'll summarize for you. Come quickly to my rescue. In Psalms 91, God is a refuge and fortress. There's more there in that particular day, but I'm going to keep going here. There's a beautiful Psalms, Psalms 114. You'll know what this one is from when, as we read it. Psalms 114, verse 1. When the Israelites escaped from Egypt, when the family of Jacob left the foreign land, the land of Judah became God's sanctuary. Where did they put the temple? Jerusalem, which was in? Judah. Judah. Oh. And Israel became his kingdom. The Red Sea saw them coming. I love the way he puts this. The Red Sea saw them coming and hurried out of their way. The water of the Jordan turned away. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. What do you think he means there? Remember the Lord is on top of Mount Sinai and what's the mountain doing? Shaking. Shaking. They're wondering if the thing's gonna fall down. There's a mighty earthquake. And maybe we should quit there. I mean, it goes on. What's wrong, Red Sea, that made you hurry out of their way? What happened, Jordan River, that you turned away? Why mountains did you skip like rams? Why hills like lambs? 
And it goes on from there. God is in control of his creation. And it talks about uh, well, it asks another difficult question. What are some of the spiritual dangers we face as believers today? Want to wander into that? Scary topic. What do you think? Spiritualism? Yeah, in what way are you thinking, though? A lot of it on TV and movies. That's true. That's true. I wouldn't go to a spiritist to get my fortune read. But your TV can pump out a lot of that same stuff. I was wondering how you were thinking there. Anything else? Oh, 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 I see what you're talking about. How about the current culture? You know, I mean, you can uh, wander into politics here and find yourself in sinking sand, I suppose, because there will be 20 opinions. But some of the most common things that we as our society think to do, the Bible calls an abomination. Anyway, since our time is getting away fast here, let me take you to Psalms 20, verses 1 to 3. I love just reading the Psalms with you here because David can say it better than we can. In times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of, of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. May he send you help from his sanctuary and strengthen you from Jerusalem. Thursday's lesson is about help from the sanctuary. What kind of help are we going to get from the sanctuary? What is that? What is that? What do you think of when you think of God helping from his sanctuary? There you go. In the Forgiveness in the courtyard even. Before you ever get inside the sanctuary, here we have the altar where the sacrifice is burned before you ever get into the sanctuary, purifying the sinner. And there's the laver, the baptism symbolized right there outside in the, in the courtyard before you ever get in the sanctuary. You get inside the sanctuary, you have three pieces of furniture inside the sanctuary. You have the, the table of showbread. Without going too deep into it, that's God's word, his body, his word. On the other side, you have the lamp with the uh, lamp lit, burning the olive oil, olive oil representing the Holy Spirit producing light, the light of Jesus. Uh, and in front of the curtain, you have the prayer altar, the prayer altar of incense, where the priest would pray with his back to the congregation, at least those who could see through the door, and he would pray the prayers of the people, and the smoke of the incense would go over the top of the curtain to God himself. And what's inside the most holy place? The Shekinah glory, God himself. God. There, demonstrating how his forgiveness happens outside, where we claim the blood of Jesus as represented by the Lamb, how the three articles in the holy place help us walk the life that he's asking us to walk. And the final step is we will stand in God's presence. We will stand in God's presence. Hebrews, Hebrews 4.15, it's actually in your lesson, but if you don't have your lesson, turn to it. This is one of those that I hope you always remember. It's more uh, 16 that I really want you to look at. Hebrews 4.15 
In 1844, our high priest moved from the holy place into the most holy place. And it starts out in 15, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. In 16, this is to you and every person in the world. Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it. The whole sanctuary service is about forgiveness of our sins. And he doesn't ask you, well, is that your 12th time back here? You've only got two more to go and then you're out. That never comes up. It's every time you want the repentance and the and the connection to be reestablished no matter how far away you've gone in your life the temple door is open come on in let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God what does it say in some of the other versions anybody else let us come with confidence confidence you ever feel like you're not good enough to come before God He doesn't agree with you. If you haven't underlined this text or highlighted it in your electronic Bible, do so. Let us come boldly to the throne of God. We could go to Hebrews and a few other places where he highlights that as well. Our time is up and a little past, but I got a couple things I want to read you. The reason why... God's professed people have no greater strength is that they trust so much to their own wisdom and do not give the Lord an opportunity to reveal his power in their behalf. He will help his believing children in every emergency if they will place their entire confidence in him and faithfully obey him. Patriarchs and Prophets 4.93 The extra reading was about the night of struggle where Jacob is headed back home to meet his angry brother. As you know, Jacob stole the birthright and his brother was going to kill him. But he was going to wait till the dad was dead. At any rate, as Jacob is headed back and he's headed back by the Lord's direction, he's a little concerned about that meeting. And as he realizes their imminent meeting is gonna happen the next day, he splits his group in half. He puts his favorite people in one side and his less favorite people in the other, I suppose. I don't know how he did it. Hoping that at least one side would live and he stays behind on the other side of the brook, the creek that they're at to pray. Have you ever expected God to come when you prayed? Well, even not in person. God comes when you pray. He came with Jacob in person. That's a little more unusual. Jesus himself showed up to discuss the matter. Jacob assumed he was an enemy. Don't think too harshly of Jacob. You've thought that too when things didn't go exactly right in your life. We think of God as an enemy. And so Jacob and God struggled together all night. And finally, the Lord says, let me go because sunrise is coming and you cannot see my face. And Jacob wins. says, I will not let you go. That's the only good thing he did that night. Well, praying was good to you, but I will not let you go until you bless me. You know what God's blessing is? Touches his hip and wrenches it, wrenches it out of joint. Jacob's probably thinking to himself, great. I wasn't very confident in meeting my brother, and now I'm I'm temporarily lame or maybe he always was I don't really know 
But that very thing, along with a little visit from God to Esau, when he saw his brother helpless and limping, his brother and his large army did not kill them. God's ways are not your ways. And as we've seen so far in this lesson, sometimes he even uses death to save people. The greatest victories to the church of Christ or to the individual Christian are not those that are gained by talent or education, by wealth or the favor of men. They are those victories that are gained in the audience chamber with God. When earnest, agonizing faith lays hold upon the mighty arm of power. Prayer. That's Patriarchs and Prophets 203. Psalms 91. We'll end with this. He will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. Some of you could probably quote that in some other version. He will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. Well, thank you for the time that we spent and the extra minutes that I took. Happy Sabbath, and let's end with prayer here. Lord, we thank you so much for the moments that we could pray together <clears throat> and worship together and talk about your everlasting love and watch care over us even when we don't feel it. We have one in our very midst here today who's feeling the sharp pains of a loved one that's gone. And Lord, you know that we sometimes wonder what you're doing and we don't understand. But give us that faith that trusts even when we don't understand and we don't like how it's turning out, give us that faith to trust. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.